Good morning, good evening, good whatever time you're listening to this podcast. My name is James Albarn and welcome to episode 34 of The Last Line. Thank you very much for joining me. I hope you are all splendid and well. In this episode of the podcast, you'll hear my conversation that I had earlier this year with actor and uh, motion capture performer Ace Ruel. Uh, Now, it's kind of a podcast in two halves. Uh, We talk about Ace's uh, work uh, in the sort of the second half of the podcast. Uh, But first, uh, we talk uh, in sort of great detail about Ace's ongoing battle and struggles uh, with the Home Office. Um, And you will hear all about that right now. So without further ado, here is Ace Ruel. My story has been getting around in a sense in regards to my home office situation, which is about, it, it, it highlights about deportation, removal and limited leave. But the main thing is about me being born here and having to fight deportation and then having to fight my indefinite leave being revoked and being placed on limited leave to have to pay every 30 months, though I can't be deported or I, or and I was born and grown here. So taking it back to the beginning of how it all started, it was basically because I got in trouble with the police. That is what obviously prompts the whole situation. So I was born and grown here as the average person and you you know you believe that you are British or English or whatever you, you you don't see anything you don't know law you don't know immigration law so obviously I used to when I when in my teen years I got involved in 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 the drug life the crime life and everything like that you know not so deep thoroughly deep into it but I was a part of that lifestyle and what happened is when I got arrested for imitation robbery with, with, with robberies with imitation firearms when I was 19, I'm 33 now, I went to, I was put on remand. When I got sentenced a year later, I got served an eight year sentence and served four years in prison and five months in a detention center. So I'd say in about, yeah, it was 2010. So I was in prison from 2007, got, got sentenced in 2008. So I'll be out in 2011. And in 2010, probably just about a, a year before I'm supposed to be released, a year and two months, I get, I, so a female officer hands me a letter and, and in the letter it talks about deportation. And I'm confused because I'm like, what do you mean deportation? Like, why, why am I going to be facing deportation? What, because I visit Jamaica? What, I, I don't understand. I, I was born and grown here. I don't, I don't, get, I never understood and for me, that was like, that was, I, there was two times I probably, I could say that I cried in jail. The first time I went inside, because I thought to myself, what have I done? You know, who, my mother, well, I came from a single parent and, you know, what have I done to my mother? I left my brothers. And when I got that letter, because I'm like, what, what, I'm, I'm confused. What I, obviously I was going to fight, but in that precise, specific moment, getting that letter was like, it was overwhelming. But being me, you know, you, you let out your system and then you you go into the to the journey. So um, I went to court first in 2011, before I went to the detention center, if I remember, or just as I went to the detention center. I can't remember specifically the date I went to court for the first time, but it was in 2011. And I won my appeal because, you know, the judge best, the judge turned around and basically said like, you know, you, 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 you're, you're homegrown, like everything you've learned and everything you've done has been from here. I didn't, you know, have a life in Jamaica and came back as some bad boy or anything like that. It was Everything was picked up here. So after my sentence finished, I went to the detention center and then Home Office appealed that decision and I won that again. And then, and that was in April, no, that was in February. It was no, it was January. I went to back January 2012. I went back to court after the first appeal. I went back to court for the second time. I won that. And then in 2012, April, I came out of prison. So because I had won my appeals twice 
and everything. Like I was, gr- I was granted. Immig- it's listen, my story is even more complicated. But it, it, it these are. The, it, I was granted immigration bail before I even um, went to court and stuff like that. But my probation officer at the time was being a real douchebag, should we say? You know, if we <laughs> we're gonna say douchebag to not you know swear on the podcast, but it was being a real douchebag for no reason, no apparent reason. And I had to get prison lawyers involved that deal with prison lawyer, like that deal with prison that made, when, once they got involved, he must've thought, okay, I, I'm, I'm serious about, you know, why are you messing around? All of a sudden I now can be free on, on bail. So after I came out in 2012, April the 2nd, I remember clearly cause it was like 13 days before my both birthday and home office appealed again. So this is the so first time they appealed, it went to court. Second went to upper tribunal. Then the third time it went to high court. But because I'm out of prison now, it takes longer to go to court. When you're in prison, the process is quick. So I went court twice in like three, oh, four about. months. Yeah. They because obviously it's like, you know, they've got I, you there. So yeah, they <laughs> yeah. speed yeah. it up. If I if they lose, they can ship me straight from prison straight to 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 Jamaica. Yeah. But it took a year before I went back to court. So in 2013. I've been out of prison for a year, just about a year, because it's February. So call it 10 months. And then again, you know, the, the court ruled in my favor because it's like he was born and grown here. And you know what? He has family here. Like there's nothing to it. So when you were going back that, uh, sorry, third third time, all right. Um, at what what, what what were you thinking at that point in terms of were you pretty confident because the judge had said before like he's born and grown here you know there's there's not there's nothing to do here yeah were you fairly confident going back like because i imagine if you've just gotten out of prison um i imagine i mean i you know i can't imagine the feeling of getting out of prison that first day must be both amazing but also kind of strange and- yeah, for for me it wasn't I, like for me i was very kind of connected to the outside i, I okay. had one day when i went westfield and it uh, if it, it like it hit me a little bit but apart from that it because okay do you know it is because for me it wasn't i never had a proper release date so it's not like i could get excited for this one day when you're on when you're in sure. detention yeah. center it's like okay you've passed it now. Now it's just like when you're going to get bailed to get out, there's like, you know, and then you get out, you feel the breeze, you know, most guys that are straight probably see a girl, you know, it's like, see the family, go see a female, you know, like, but for me and answering your question, when it came to going to court, I was, I was, I was definitely hundred percent confident, but obviously in the back of my mind, I knew that, you know, something could, something could change. But if you ask me, I didn't really believe what would be the reason why. But it's, it is a bit like, oh, imagine this judge, you know, you know, you can get yeah. judges that are, we're going to say the word douchebag again. So <laughs> we can get some judges that are douchebag and have very, very biased opinion, which is what happened with one of the recent cases on, in my situation. So I was very confident, but at the same time, in the back of my mind, I just, you know, I had that weariness, like, don't be overconfident. Don't tell everybody, yeah, I'm going to win. It's nothing. It's okay. You you don't want to do that because sometimes life just says, oh, yeah, all right, cool. We're going to hit you with the reverse. So, but yeah, then so after that situation, 2013, I won. That's it. They can't deport me no more. There's no more deportation orders. It's all been exhausted. So I'm I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm good. I'm all right. You know, I'm I'm back to normal now. You know, I just got to don't mess up. Because if I mess up, it can all trigger again. So two and a half years later, 2015, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm left alone. I tried to go to my MP to, you know, sort out my, my citizenship and stuff, because it's like, I've been told by Jamaica, I'm not a citizen of Jamaica and I'm not a citizen of here. I've only got IRL, indefinite leave. So, you know, I'm, I'm technically stateless in a way because I don't have citizenship anywhere. I've got Jamaican nationality, but not citizenship. So I'm talking to the MP, trying to sort it out. From the MP communicating with the Home Office, the Home Office decided to send me another letter talking about they're going to remove my IRL and put me on limited leave. Again, in my mind, I'm confused because it's like, 
I've been out of prison now for three and a half years. I've not caused any problem, not been arrested, nothing. I've, I've worked, I've had my child, my other child was on the way. You know, I'm, I'm working with schools, councils, everything, you know, to, to, to lead a better, use my past as a, as a way to educate the youth of today to, you know, to say, if you decide to go down this path, this is where it may lead you. And these are the things that can happen. So I'm thinking I'm taking all the boxes as a rehabilitated being. So I don't get why the home office is on me again. And the fact I can't be deported, deported and the fact I was born and grown here. So like, why would you want to put me on limited leave? So, so sorry, just to clarify that point for the listener, you can't be deported because you are not, you don't have citizenship here, but even though you were born here and you, but you don't have citizenship in Jamaica, which is where they want to send you because you have a Jamaican passport because your yeah. mother, right? Yeah. Cause yeah. Cause my mother's nationality. And so the read that was, yeah, basically because of my parents being Jamaican, that is the, and me being born after 1983, meaning if you're born after 1983, you're not a UK citizen automatically. That's the reason why they wanted to deport, de- deport me, obviously, because I committed a crime, but that triggered of them trying to attempt it. But they don't, they don't have to, but, you know, they took their chance. This is the thing that confuses me, and I'm sure it confuses you a lot more, like someone who's actually dealing with it. But what confuses me is that they're trying to deport you, but, like, what happens if you get deported to Jamaica? Can Jamaica just turn around and go, well, no, we don't want him because he's not a citizen? Yeah, Jamaica. Yeah, Jamaica will most likely do that. The Jamaica would do that. Jamaica so then, where, so then, where do you where, yeah, like? Just, where are you supposed to go yeah, then? They'll just put me back. Well, from what I know, what happens because it's happened to people before. The country just puts the person back on a plane to the back to the to the UK because I know people that's happened. I know people when I was in the det- detention center that it's happened too. You know, right. So and then they and then those people presumably just end up back in a detention center. Yeah. Until you know okay. it gets all sorted. So continue what I'm saying from 2015. So they I've I've won my all my deportation case. So I, I can't be deported because I've legally reasons why and because of the whole situation. So they want to take my indefinite leave and put me on limited leave, meaning that, you know, if they refuse my limited leave, they can try to remove me from the country, which is technically the same as deporting, deporting someone, removing them. But obviously it's a different, it's a different tactic. So in 2016, I'm in court. By the time 2016's come to court, you know, I've got two kids now with my partner for how many years working, starting the um, Legend of Tarzan film, doing the mocap stuff and working as an active facilitator, working with councils to, you know, the, the what I call my heart work, when it's about not about money or anything. It's just about giving back in a formal way. And I go to court and the judge says, you know, cut a long story short, I commend you. You've, you've changed your life. Your, your ties are here. I even stronger. You know, I showed proof of work. I showed and, Again, I'm, I'm happy to, anybody listening, I'm happy to show all paperwork of what the two, because this is where it gets all crazy anyway, but let me get to it. So the judge turned around and said, look, I commend you. You've, t- you've turned your life around. You've got reference, good character references from your, my probation officer, you know, because a probation officer is like, that's like the highest person you could probably get a reference from because I, I finished probation, but I had one written from her because we still communicated. You know, I had... I had letters from councils, from schools, from where I done my my acting studies to personal ones like my partner and everything, work contracts from filming to being a facilitator, everything. So the judge said, look, he don't see any reason why I'll be put on limited leave for apart from being a, a mental stress and a, a, an, an expense, a financial expense, because if he can't be deported, for legal reasons, and he's not committed any offences in the last four and a half years, what was the pur- pur- purpose of putting him on living leave? So I won. So of course I know the Home Office is going to appeal because that's what they do. You know, they got unlimited money. 
So I go back to court in five months. But this time the judge has a different opinion. He has another opinion. The judge turns around. And, uh, uh, the judge basically, when I got my court papers, this, I didn't get my court papers till years after. But first of all, the judge, I'm, I'm just going to go through the ones where the judge was contradicting because I don't know the exact law by itself. But I'm going to show you, talk about the ones that I read that didn't make no sense in his final, in his final say. The ones that contradicted was he said, I should have, I should have had it here and read it word for word. He he said that I never show proof of suitable employment. So therefore I had a financial incentive to reoffend. But I'd showed the last judge not just acting work, because okay, you could say, you know, not not anyone's really filming all the time, but I had part-time work as well with Hackney Council, Hackney CVS as well as with Generation Arts, which was the place where I studied as an actor and then became a facilitator. So I had part-time work to keep me going in case I wasn't getting any roles. So that's BS. And then he turned around and said also that I never showed proof of family ties apart from with my one son who was born on October 2013 on the 9th. And the reason why I have to say that is because I had two children at the time. The last judge said I supplied my children's birth certificates. How does the judge get my, my child's date wrong from 2013, October the 9th, and my child was born 2014, October the 11th? Like, you've got birth certificates. It's not like they're dead. The judge said they were dead. How, how are you getting those wrong? And I gave you two. So where's my other son? <laughs> Do you also, disagree? as well, also, as well, again, what confuses me about that is it says, He's shown no family ties other than his one son, it, it, as if having one son isn't sufficient family ties enough. Like I don't know, <laughs> but my partner was there in court, so I don't understand. What did you think I paid her to be there? <laughs> it was the same person that was in court the last time. Yeah. So where did you get this information from? And if you had the birth certificates and personal letters of my mum, my partner's parents, my partner, what what? What did you think? They all just wrote it just because they thought, you know what, let's just try to do anything. And I'm not saying that, you know, you couldn't get a friend to write something for you in the night, in the knee, but my missus's parents uh, was an additional one, at least, you know, like that's, yeah, they're, they're, they're old school. Like my mom, of course, your mom will write for you, you know, your partner, you could probably get a girl, but she's got both my kids. So it's not like it's just any girl. She has both our names yeah. on the certificate. And then the last one he said, was that because in my letter to the home office, so you know when the home office came to me in 2015, every time the home office comes to somebody, you got to write, they ask you to write a letter to them to, you know, to explain why they shouldn't be putting this court order against you. I don't know why they do it because I don't think they've ever had a letter written to them and they've been like, you know what, we're going to leave you alone. So I think- It's all right, yeah. yeah. (laughs) I I don't get why. Because then I don't, if anybody can ever come out and say, you know what, the home office got at me and I wrote a letter and they like, we're going to leave you alone. Then I commend (laughs) you. You are special. So, and in my letter- must have been a bloody good letter. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what did they, they probably had to say that my my the, their family were royal and politicians or something like that? They yeah, were, yeah, it couldn't be no normal person. So in my letter, in it, you know, I I also put in a letter that you know I feel like it's a a racial a racial conspiracy. Like, it, why is it? Because this is the whole thing that's going on with you know black and all of this stuff, and it's like I don't get why you're troubling me after three and a half years. I, I haven't done anything. I've I've done everything correct. So. You know, I believe there might be some racial situation in it. And so the judge said, because I had mentioned that in my letter, not for my grounds of my appeal, because I mentioned it in my letter, I had not come to the terms of my sentence and not and wasn't taking the steps to no longer reoffend. That's what he said. So he's saying that a letter, because I put that part in a letter, because the other judge wrote it, the first judge said, I saw this serious allegation, but I can understand where he's coming from, but he didn't try to use it as his grounds of appeal. So I didn't go to court saying, this is the one of the reasons why you should allow me my appeal. No, it was never in there. So if the judge recognized it and it wasn't a part of my appeal and it was just in a letter, how are you using that letter to say that I'm not taking the steps to no longer reoffend? 
and coming to terms with my with my with my crime. Huh? What? So because of all of these and other stuff that a lawyer would understand more, he, he denied my appeal. So the home office got the win. And then whenever I tried to appeal, because I get my two appeals, no court would hear it. You know, so it was like, wow, I've actually lost. Like, and for me, I, I you know what? And I was more confident now than I was during my deportation cases because I've been out of prison for four and a half years, no reoffending, had children. So my family ties and everything were stronger than deportation. And I'm doing yeah, all the good stuff. You've got a stronger case now than you did four yeah, years ago. Four years ago. So yeah. I, for me on paper, there should have been no way I lost, but I did. And this is what happened. So it was like, okay, cool. And then after that, it took a it took a while for them. It's like it's like the home office forgot about me because <laughs> 2017 was the last time of my appeal. Then it wasn't till April. Again, I mess. I'm talking to the home office again. I went back to my MP to say, look, this is unfair. I don't understand. Look at the look at this. The judge says this. This doesn't make sense. Home office sent me a letter talking about being removed from the UK. Blah 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 blah. I'm like, what? Being removed? What do you mean? But I didn't. But by then I kind of knew I was more safe, but the letter, it's like, they just, it's like they just send you the generic letter and it said big removal from the UK, la, la, la. But my lawyer at the time contacted them, blah, blah, blah. And then I was placed on limited leave because they obviously revoked my IRL and now I'm on limited leave. Um, yeah. And my limited leave expires in, on, on, in August. And obviously I've, I've got to pay. If I don't pay, they say they, they can't, they say if I don't pay, I'm only an overstayer, and then it's a criminal offence, and then I don't know what can happen from there. But yeah, so that's and the how position much do you in. have to? Well, how much do you have to pay, and two, how often do you have to pay? Two grand, three hundred and forty-eight pounds, and every two and a half years, and and it goes up because it weren't that price two and a half years ago. So the the second judge who completely just sort of. Uh, it seemingly disagreed with most of the things the first judge said, who said, you know, he's great, you know, leave him alone. Um, I just want to go back to the, so, cause um, I heard you talk about this as well in your, uh, in a, in a little piece that I think um, RT did that you featured in. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned the sort of the, you, you, I think you said something in it along the lines of, and I'm not quoting you, but um, either it, either someone's lost all the paperwork and no one's admitting to it, or it's a racist thing, right? Yeah. Um, and when you said that, in my mind, I kind of thought could be both. <laughs> like it literally could be both those yeah. things, right? Like, um, but do you think so? When you wrote that um, in your letter of reply, you wrote about you feel like there there may be a racial element to it, um, and this isn't me sort of like disagreeing with you yeah. or 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 blaming you in any way, like because I can completely understand why you would write that, and I think most people would would recognize. Well, I, at least I would hope I. I can't tell these days, but um, I would hope that most people would sort of uh, would agree with you on that. But do you think there's an element that maybe that judge the second time round almost like took offense to it and j just uh, sort of used that against you? Because like, you know, when some people are like, like people seem to be really offended at the moment, like, if if someone points out racial injustice, it seems to offend people. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, and so like I said, it's it's not uh like blaming you in any way, but like, do you think it like maybe part of the reason is like he he's that kind of person that like gets offended by the idea that there's racial injustice and you know. You know what the the thing is, I, I I do believe that could have played a part in it. You know, I do believe 
that could have played a part, but I feel like for that to play a part overriding everything else. You have to ignore everything else in your Yeah, you have to ignore like case, yeah. You know, because the in, in my court f- papers it said all my paperwork, all everything I provided went unchallenged by the home office. Like they didn't challenge my work, they didn't challenge my letters, they didn't challenge nothing. So you would really have to go have to have some kind of dig mm. for you to be like, you know what? F this guy that has, you know, rehabilitated and changed his life around after. Like, if it was, like, straight after my deportation case, I can understand. But it's four and a half years. Like, yeah. So I feel like... like it, yeah, no, go on. No, sorry. It Because it, it just strikes me that, like you said, if you're ignored... Like, I, I just don't understand. And I'm sure you've tried to, like turn it over in your brain like hundreds of times right but i like i just don't understand if you've got the evidence there presented to you then like that can that seems to me like be the only reason that yeah. it's like it is a racial thing or like you said it's an incompetence thing and somewhere along the line all of your stuff that you provided the first time around is like no yeah. longer there but it's crazy because it's like it's only my evidence that's gone missing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about the evidence provided by the Home Office? They really got much apart from the criminal stuff, whatever. But they were, their stuff didn't go missing. Why did my stuff go missing? Like, why did my... If it, if it is the case that stuff went missing, why is it like just sections of my part went missing? Like, How? You know what I'm saying? So yeah, it's either that, and for me, it's either, you know, it's, I don't, I don't want to act as if like you know, this is like a movie. You know, in a movie when someone trying to do something dodgy, something like that. But you know, stuff like that does actually happen. Like, there's no denying it. You know, I just think to myself, like, who am I for you to want to do it with my case? Like, who am I? You know, to to the Home Office, like. Who am I that someone would want to remove my paperwork if it was? Because they all the bundle all comes together. So, and it's not like you know, it was it was all my was all the evidence on my side at the top, and the top half went missing, and everything else stayed, or was it in different sections in the middle, and the middle part went missing? Like what? Like how? Because it normally comes all as one. Like so, because the home office would present theirs, and my lawyer would present theirs. So what just, and it stays from court to court. So it doesn't come back out and then go back. It stays from one tribunal to the upper tribunal to the high court. And then after why it gets destroyed. So it's, was that the case or did the judge have a bias already? Because I was speaking to a lawyer last week and they said, you know what? Some judges for some reason have this grudge against when it comes to robbery crimes, there's this judge and that judgment around it. Like some judges, when it comes to robbery, for them, it's just like, you know what? Nah, can't, like, they just have this biased thing, you know, which could be the same for, you know, if there was a female judge that had been through rape and was dealing with somebody that was on a rape charge, they might have a, a personal thing on it, you know, or if they had a friend that was raped. So that's, that's all understandable and I get it. But what we can't miss in the fact is that, thank God my case wasn't a sexual case and anything like that. And yeah, I did do what I did. But the fact is, with all the evidence that was provided and the fact that I can't be deported and the fact the duration of time has been so far apart, the purpose of putting me on limited leaves four and a half years after I've been out of prison doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. And I'm not going to lie, from when I was in court, and obviously there's no way I can prove it apart from my, my partner stating it, from when I was in court, I could tell the judge was a bit offish with me from a certain way he responded to certain things, how he responded. And I told my partner and the, my lawyer at the time, I said, I don't think it's going to go in my favor. I don't think so. Because there's certain things he said and the way he said it that you think to yourself, but I don't like, you can't, I can't challenge him saying it because he's the judge. So just keep your mouth quiet because yeah. that could just 
to it. But if he was not a judge and it was a prosecutor and I was a lawyer, I could be like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, but mm. so I had a feeling from that judge already. But then I've read certain other cases of the judge where he's favored people that are in a less situation than mine and, you know, granted them their appeal. And I'm there thinking, right, it must have been something that annoyed him or the home office had influence on him. It's either one of the two. So it has to be one of the three. I have something in my case really annoyed him because I've read a case where, you know, he allowed, it was a, it was a, it was a, I think a black or non-white anyway, and he allowed it you know, because mm. of family ties and everything and stuff like that. And the person wasn't even born here. So if I wanted to go by, you know, he's a straight out racist, then it's like, well, wouldn't he, wouldn't he be like that with a lot of other people? Or, you know, he let some, he let some go because if you're like that with everybody else, you're going to have a pattern. Mm. Or was it something in my case that really we thought, you know, F this, or, you know, did he, did he have someone from the home office that, you know, you know, was, Cause like people like I, like I said I don't want to make it seem like it's a movie and so but we, we can't deny like come on wasn't Boris or somebody that allowed somebody to get certain contracts with him thinking like people do it like let's yeah. so let's not let's not behave and I don't want to make it saying that's the reason why but I wouldn't be surprised if someone in the Home Office you know said you know find find a way to make him lose his appeal find a way. You know, find a way. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised. But then it makes me question, like, why again? Like coming back to like, why has the Home Office got such a uh, like a you know seemingly a grudge against you? It would would also seem like strange, you know? Uh, 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 it, it it makes me wonder. Like, so I did um, I did jury service. Uh, well, not last year, the year before. I kind of left, kind of scared about how how the justice system works and i don't i you know i don't know what the better solution is or anything like that um but you know it just struck me then when you were talking about you know maybe the judge is biased in some way towards uh robbery or you know is it racial bias or and it it just worries me that there is these like little biases at play all the time in the system um, that you can't really account for, even if your case seems to be really strong. And you know what I mean? Yeah, no, no, I definitely agree with you. And the reason why is because we, I have to, we have to remember that the people that are in these positions are humans. Some of them ain't even, you know, got their mental mindset in check. You know, some of them are still not even emotionally developed in the sense that they're just reactors. They, they, they don't know how to take in and let out and, you know, not hold Like there's so many people in these, in these positions that we, we see as power that are not emotionally stabled to a degree, you know? And I mean, look at our prime minister, I mean. <laughs> you know? So <laughs> it's just like, when you start breaking it down in those kind of complexes, you start to realize that it's why you can get a decision like that. I, 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 I ended up getting it, but again, even though I did get it and I can understand from whatever perspective, whether it was racist, whether, you know, he was, he, he had a bias against Robbie, whatever, blah, blah. By the end of the day, the evidence that you said to the reason why you made me, why you gave the homage for my appeal, that, that, that don't add up because paperwork was there. So, you know, if he had turned around and said, you know, F the evidence, it was weak. Then that's different. You saying the evidence is weak, which it can't be weak because I don't know how, but you're saying it's weak, but you made it seem like I never provided it. So that's a whole nother ball game. So someone's got to be accountable for it. Somebody has to be accountable for it. Are we blaming the court? Or are we blaming the judge? You know? So where do you go from here? Like what, what is it that you can do? Is there anything you can do? Like what is the, what is the next step for you in terms of all this? I think that the main thing for me right now is basically it's a, it's challenging the law in itself. 
that that's what really is it is because obviously apart from what in fact you know every immigration officer i ever spoke to they're like you know look it's it's out of out of appeals so there's not much you can do you know an, another judge another for, for to get my irl back and, and that sister recently said look you can apply for it if they refuse it they go for judicial review and go that way and i said yeah okay okay cool because the pay in the 30 months every month 30 months is ridiculous they don't want to give me citizenship all right cool whatever but i need my irl like you can't give me tell me you have to pay to, to, to it's, be in a country. it's a heft it's a, that's a hefty bill as well to yeah, it's, pay a, it's a, every like yeah. it's not yeah it's, it's obviously you know everyone has different earnings you know someone like idris yeah. or so but yeah it's not a nice it's not nice knowing that oh damn i gotta pay i gotta pay two two and a half grand in october you know i could have used to for that money i could have used it towards my business and stuff or whatever but it's where it is but so it's that's one little route for my irl but secondly the main thing is about taking it to the level where the right people like wanted to defend your situation you know so it being public and it going out there and i've had unions that want to help and everything and you know we'll see how far the the unions are able to have an influence in things and then it's also it's also challenging the law in itself like there's two things for me one i don't believe that anybody should be liable for deportation if you were born and grown here like it just shouldn't be a thing if you if you don't want to give somebody automatic citizenship all right cool whatever but i don't believe anybody no matter what crime you do you shouldn't be liable for deportation if you were born and grown here like what you're gonna send someone to a country because of what because that's where their bloodline comes from basically what happened if nobody in jamaica actually lives in that country that you're sending them from yeah that you know the only parent people that are alive is the parents and the grandma and the, and, and the auntie and the uncle and they're all over here so who, who are you sending that person back to are you going to expect the family to move as well like so i don't think that anyone should be liable for deportation if you're born and grown here serve your sentence that's, that's what prison's for you know what I'm saying? If you were not born here, then obviously you've got a problem. But I don't even think you should even be liable for deportation if you came in the country at two years old. Like, what? You too? Like, there's people that have been deported because of that. You were two. Like, what? Were you going to say that, that that time when your brain was developing, you know, you developed all of that criminality in the country you came from? Like, come on, you didn't bring yourself over here. Like it, it, you, you weren't at that mental awareness to jump on a plane. Like my son is not even two yet. He's two in two months and he would walk out. When I take him outside, he would happily walk into the road, cars moving, everything. He doesn't, he fathoms being high on something and looking down. Like he fathoms that like it's high, but he doesn't fathom that if he walks on the road, a car could just come and hit him. So you are going to deport somebody who came here from two and lived their whole life here and deport them because of what that, that don't, that don't make sense. But then even worse is being born here is being born. here. that's worse. So it's about challenging it and using my, using the, the, the my case, my support and my name that is continuously growing as an actor within the industry. I'm in to get to a particular state and fight it because there's many people out there that, are probably going through the same exact thing. I wouldn't say many, 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 but I'm not the only one. And um, so, okay, if you sort me out and the other person doesn't know about it, then they're in a pickle. And then what about the next person that's in the pickle? There's been some, there's been somebody that I was talking to my friend and I didn't know about her case. She was born, grown here, like born, grown here, never got in trouble. But because her parents didn't do the paperwork, when she went to apply for it at 18, they refused her. And they gave her hell. She got it in the end, but she didn't even commit a crime. <laughs> and she was born and grown here. And they still gave her hell. Why? What for? What's the reason? So for me, the next step really is to fight this on a bigger scale where it's like, let's see if we can go and attack and change the law. Because it's been done before for something. But let's see if we yeah. can go to that level. And that's really what it is for me, really. There was a there was a bit in the the, the RT video where you, you say, "What what's it going to take? Is it going to take? Do I have to win an Oscar 
to yeah. to change this. Yeah. And I thought there was part of me that my like my immediate like gut reaction was like, yeah, probably. Because yeah. there seems to be a weird thing with uh, and and I, uh, you know, I'm sort of I'm getting more and more disillusioned with like the ideas of what it means to be British and all that kind of stuff. But but I'm sure it's true in in many other countries and you know, um, but you know, I th- there does seem to be this contradiction that that we seem to be seeing at the moment where someone in your position is a success then we'll hold them up, praise them. We'll say that this is a great example of like what Britain is. You know, we, we, uh, we let people in from loads of different countries and then they can come here, they can be a success. But, it, but it seems to me if they're not reaching that pinnacle, you know, like you mentioned Idris earlier and I don't actually know Idris's background, but you know, it just seems sort of contradictory to me that you know if 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 you've got to treat sort of I don't even know what I'm saying. <laughs> so no, you know, no, you know I'm, what I'm I'm, no, no, exactly what you mean, and that's the thing because even there was an article that came out that where the Home Office said that if you have won awards or so, your situation would be fast tracked, and it is true. England do want to do that. England will claim someone that's you know become a, a particular success in the public light to be like, yeah, that's one of ours, you know. You know, that's why the reason why certain people get OBEs and stuff like that. Like, yeah. So it is one of those things where, like, okay, cool. But when I do win an award, I will tell Home Office to kiss my ass at the same time. Because at the end of the day, like, don't claim me. When I was trying to yeah. fight, you didn't want to claim me. You're going to claim me now. You can kiss my ass. And I will say it live. I, I have no, I have no filter when it comes to someone really trying to, when, when it comes to someone or, 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 or establishment trying to basically dehumanize me, you know, like trying to take advantage of me because because what well, I'm I'm a small number to the home office, like so I but so even like there was an article that came out, it resurfaced again. The other, like what was it two weeks ago? You know, Ace's plea to the home office. I was like plea, I ain't pleading for ish. I ain't pleading for nothing. No, no, no. I plead before I plead when I wrote my letters. I plead when I was in court. Like I'm not pleading now. Like I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I was, you know, I'm not even going to lie to you. If someone said to me, all you got to do is go to the home and say, I beg you, please give me my citizenship, please. I beg you on my knees and beg and I give it to you. I wouldn't do it. I just, I just wouldn't do it. It's just, I just can't because yeah, I just rather not. My pride will never allow me to do it because you can't, it's like basically asking a slave owner or, you know, someone that treated your whole, your whole family name. Someone treated James whole family name from relative to relative to relative. And then they say to you, you know what, what you got to do say, I'm just say, please get on your knees. And you have to say, thank you, master. And we'll leave you alone. Like some people can do it and I get it. And I don't look down on those that can do it, but me, no, 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 I'm not. So for me at the end of the day, I'm, I'm going to fight it until however long it takes, you know what I'm saying? And whether that I can bring it where it comes to changing the law or it has a different effect for some other individuals, I'm, I'm happy to take the fight. I'm happy. So we'll, we'll, we'll play this game for however long it takes because in the end, I'm going to win. Like, in the end, I'm going to win. Like, this is just a blip in one person's life. Like, there's somebody out here going through a billion times worse than this whole situation a billion times worse. This is why I don't complain. I don't, I don't, there's no, no one can write an article about me. You know, he was, he's been in an emotional state for years. He's been depressed. I ain't been depressed. I know I haven't because I'm still able to live. I'm still able to survive. I'm still able to maintain. I'm still able to provide. I'm still able to make a success. I've, I, and there's still multiple people out there in the millions, probably in the billion that someone would would rather my life over theirs because of what they're going through in that country. So why am I going to be here complaining about it? It's annoying. Yes. Is it annoying? hundred percent. Is it frustrating sometimes when, you know, when I get an email saying we would like to fly you out to this country to do this work, but I can't do it. Yes. Is it annoying that I can't jump on a plane, go somewhere 
and know that if I come back, it's not going to be headache. Yes, it is. But am I alive and am I well? Cool, yeah, I am. You know, if my children good, they're good. Partner well, my family, yeah, we're all good. So, all right, cool. We'll just do this long game. 11 years, I ain't cracked. So I ain't going to crack anytime forever. So we'll just go down that route. So uh, you're an actor. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier, you do a lot of uh, motion capture stuff. How did you get into sort of that area of of acting and like film production, et cetera? Do you know what it is? I, I remember my friend, when I was in the gym and he said to me, oh, Ace, you know, come join this agency. They're looking for black extras. This is like my early days to play these warriors for this thing when we're, we're making like 250 pound a day. I'm like, yeah, right. Sweet. Cool. <laughs> Sweet. You know, well, how do I get involved? You know, and, and the company is called Mad Dog and they're like one of the leading um, background agency providers for extras. Yeah. So I joined it, you know, I said, yeah, I heard you guys are looking for extras, blah, blah, blah. Somehow when I get the approval, it says on my, on my sheet in my email saying, uh, you're auditioning for Manjani. I'm like, what's a man? What's Manjani? Is that a Pacific warrior? I don't know. And then when I go there, I'm basically auditioning to play one of the apes, um, one of the background apes in the film. So I'm confused. And I thought maybe it's because I've got acting training. And I say I dance and stuff and I do physical theater. So maybe that's probably why. So I done that and I was with the guy that was running at the time who was taking the lead of the audit, the audition with the creative movement director name is Wayne McGregor. Like he's a very massive name in the, in the dance world, very massive. So I was there and uh, what happened was I got the part because I, I knew I was going to get a part. I'm not going to lie to you. And that's because when it comes to performing, if, the, if somebody says be a dog, I'll play a dog. And I'm not coming out of character. There's no, he, he, he. I'm not worrying about if somebody else is, well, no, this has been too serious. No. So I knew when I'm really being it, the others will eventually start really being it. But by then I'm, I'm in it from one and we have to learn how to use the arm extensions and, and stuff. And then, yeah, I discovered that holy smokes, like people play creatures and animals in film because I thought it was all CGI because I was going to go down the action actor route that was my thing you know like I want to be like the Wesley Snipes okay. and all of that that was my thing yeah. so when I discovered that I was like because I was going to start I start, I was going to start training for stunts and I discovered that I said this is what I want to do like you know and it's th- it's playing the creatures and the animals and monsters in film that's what I want to do but I didn't know that it was motion capture and so obviously you know, when I spoke to him, he said, look, Ace, these are the studios, you, you know, get at them, everything, blah, blah, blah. So I, I'm not going to lie. I've I done Legend of Tarzan and I started as the background ape. And then for reshoots, I played all the main apes apart from the brother. And then I also done the lions as well in the film. So for me, it was like, I can definitely do this. I love physical movement. Like I, I like physical physicality, changing the voice, breathing different and all of that. And that was from 2014 to 2016. Cause there was quite a few reshoots. It wasn't like every month or so, but the first time I shot, it was like a good, like three, two to three months. And then after like each year, it was like a month or so for reshoots. And then I tried to do the, you know, the normal thing, you email the studios, you know, I'm emailing Imaginarium, Andy Circus. By then, I knew about Andy Circus. You know, Planet of the Apes. I didn't, I didn't know about Gollum because I didn't watch any of the Lord of the Rings, and I still ain't. But I knew about Planet of the uh, Apes. What wise? I would say <laughs> I'm not a Lord of the Rings fan. So, <laughs> so I didn't know. I, I only knew Andy Circus from Planet of the Apes, whereas a lot of people knew yeah. from Gollum. So you know, I contacted his studio, emailed everyone, and one day replied back to me you know, but they were asking for specific things that I didn't have the skills in, which was like certain weapons and stuff. 
And I'm not going to lie. I'm, you know, if James emails me, Ace, we'd like to use you for, you know, spare and shield. I'd be like, I've never trained in it. Give me choreography. I can 100% make it look because I do moving, but I'm not trained in it. So I'm not going to lie. And then I went on link. And then after I tried a different tactic, and it took me a while to try a different tactic. When I went on LinkedIn, I, I messaged, every, I basically messaged everybody that had motion captured towards their name in, in at the studio. And then one studio, Imaginarium, Andy Circus is, the vice president emailed me, re- replied back to my message. I said, I'll put you in touch with our casting director. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't yeah. have, I wouldn't have thought that would have worked. Like if, if, if you were like, Oh, James, what you need to do is go and message everyone on LinkedIn, including the vice president. I'd be like, they're never going to reply to me, are they? Yeah. So that's I, amazing. I, I'm not going to lie. I was shocked. <laughs> Obviously I feel like the, the legend of Tarzan credit helped you know, because yeah. it was there. Yeah, yeah. And obviously Imaginarium is like, you know, you think about the animal, blah, blah. Yeah. So yeah, he done that. And then I auditioned for Planets of the Apes in 2017, the first video game. And I didn't get it, but I got to do the VR version the following year. And 2000, I would say two. So I first done Mocap in 2014, but I would say I didn't really get it. Like I didn't... I thought, okay, only film. I didn't even fathom video games until... Oh, the video game, yeah. Yeah, until my the, the new agent that I joined said, oh, I've got a job. And I went and they said, oh, it's for a video game. I'm like, I, I, didn't, even, I didn't even fathom. I thought mocap creature film. That's all I, that's what I thought. I didn't even fathom video games. So that my first video game. And then it was like, oh, cool. Oh, she's there's... And then I thought, but again, I think about branding and I, I think about branding, I think about marketing and I'm like, okay, cool. If I go down the normal acting route, there's many other black actors going down that route. Oh, there's no one really black in the world of motion capture. I'm like, I'll go down this route. This route will have, I can plant my, my feet here because it's not been planted, you know? And then even still trying to get in wasn't that easy. But then when I, started doing showing showcasing my creature skills my creature movement you know i got my own pair of arm extensions i had to have it made because you couldn't get nowhere you could not get it nowhere i tried to ask warner brothers for it when i'd done it for them couldn't get it nowhere and then my partner's dad he can do stuff so he followed a youtube thing i had my one i make videos and then for people who don't know that they're, they're they almost look like crutches don't they yeah crutches well, the ones yeah. I got, you know, they're a different design, but the the old ones, yeah, <laughs> the crutches. I, I still use crutch versions that I've like, I've changed and made it even like yeah. 10 times better than it was when it first was made. So what I started doing was, oh, what can I do to get people to see what I do? And then on LinkedIn, I started making videos, just LinkedIn, just on LinkedIn. I would add everybody from the VFX world as much as I can. And then I would make videos around creature movement. So, you know, my first video was how to be a zombie. Cause I'll look online and I'll be like, how to be a zombie, how to act like a zombie. And like only one or two videos will come up. And it wasn't even like a thorough thing. I was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna make this video. And then what really got me really recognized within the industry is when I started making reference videos of creature movement with arm extensions. So, you know, you know, walking different walk cycles. So you call it walk cycles in a video game. I'm not sure if you know, or if you do, you don't, but it's like, you have specific walk cycles, locomotion. So I would create different walks with the arm extensions. One like an ape, one like a cat, one like a mystical creature. And those started getting hits. So I started getting 5,000 views, 7,000 views, 10,000 views. And then it was like, okay, I see this is catching attention. And then I started, and then I said, you know what? I don't want to be like Andy Circus because if I only stay with arm extensions, I'm going to be just like, they're going to say, oh, it's like the black Andy Circus, you know, or blah, blah. So I then went on to get a pair of digi legs and jump stilts. And all of these videos that I created have kept me being hired by different people. And because they knew that I can do physical stuff as well, because they were arcs, that I could do stunt stuff and everything and all of that. And I could do the creature. So the creature was the way that really got me into motion capture. It was like, because the reason why is because in motion capture, if James is really good, James can play a black person, a white person, an Asian person, a female, like you can play loads of people. 
So it's like the studio just hire, can just hire you and the team that they know they can play the mm. different roles. So it's just like for you to get in, you've got to be offering something that they can't get their hands on just like this. And so I, the, the videos I was putting, I was able to influence people to be like, because there's no one else making these videos. Like you can go on YouTube and put, you know, the certain reference and no one else is making videos like me. So it's just like, it comes with the appearance and, and marketing. Like maybe he's the only one, you know, I know I'm not mm -hmm. the only one that can do these things, but I'm the only one that's, it's like Andy Serkis is not the first person to do motion capture, but because yeah. he was put on the spotlight with motion capture, you can't think of motion capture and not think of Andy Serkis. So I, I played off that, you know, understanding branding and marketing like, like I do. And yeah, I'm in a position now where I've done, I've done, I don't know, maybe what, I don't even know how many video games I've done for, since 2017, because that's when I've done my first game. I've probably done about six, seven titles and uh, Legend of Tarzan. I, I played the, um, a big, I played a big part in the Eternal Marvels. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, in that. We're talking about motion capture and visual effects and all this it's kind of technical stuff, but like at its core, it's still very much performance and acting, right? How do you, uh, how does your approach change when you're, say, doing a, a normal scene that is not motion capture based and a scene where, you know, you've got to emote, but through, your sort of physicality because you, you might not have dialogue because you're playing an ape, for instance, or a lion or something like that. Yeah. You know, it is, it's just, when you're playing a human character, it's just basically you, for me, this is me. When you're playing a human character, it's your subconscious interpretation of that character. That's what it's always going to be. You always, in fact, anything you do, you're always going to come from your basically subconscious belief of what you believe that is. And then you're going to find a way to execute it. So you still have to perform at your thing because your work shows in the data. The crapper you are, the more work the animator's got to do. In, in motion capture, it's just about understanding spatial awareness, your movement, and when to be subtle and when to be bold and when to do little things that you just need because it will look better for the video game and, 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 and stuff like that. One other thing I want to talk to you about is uh, like the talks you give. How did that start? How did you sort of get into doing that sort of stuff? Because I think earlier, correct me if I'm wrong, you said you said something along the lines of like that's like the heart stuff, if you see yeah. what I mean. Like that's like that's the stuff that's like uh to like give back, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, it was when I came out, you know, I tried to do the basic thing off of trying to get a job late, like most people got late night jobs and, you know, stacking them, all of that stuff. I tried and it, it just like my heart went in it. Like I'll apply for stuff, but you know, you hope you don't get it and, and stuff. And I think I almost got close to getting one, but it was like, I'm in Northwest London and the job's all the way in South. I'm going to have to travel at night. Or, so it's like, there's nothing weirder than applying for a job that you don't want. Yeah, and just, when you get the rejection, you actually feel glad, but then also like a little sense of like annoyed because you're like, why, why, yeah, why yeah, don't you yeah, want me? Yeah, but yeah. I don't want to be there. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. So you know, it's just like I just, and then I remember I was doing my acting, and one the tutor introduced me to somebody, and when I told them about my story, they're like, look, you could, we could use someone like you, and that was. First, the first time I started doing talk stuff was at the London Mayor's office called the Pay Outreach Team. And like, I, I think after a month of being there, I became like a team leader because I'm very outspoken. So I, I will speak, um, public speaking is something I could do easily, just easy. And so that, it started through doing that way and doing talks with, um, with organizations like for for youth it was about the pay outreach team was about youth like doing stuff across london for the youth then that between hackney cvs that was one of the main things as well hackney cvs i've done a lot of work in hackney for stop and search talks 
to going into school doing talks and people want to talk to me about you know my experience in prison and from doing loads of talks and people listening to my talks I get asked so like I've even went even the old Bailey I've, I've done a few talks at the old Bailey and all of the stuff that I've done talk wise has never been me like emailing people I think I almost done it once where I emailed a few schools and I'm like you know forget this this is long I'm not emailing nobody because there's a thing where I do it when if I'm requested to do it I'm not gonna I, and I'm or, or sometimes I might you know put my my social media if you need someone to come to your school to do a talk let me know like I don't charge so you know I've been paid for it but it's not me like you know, James says, can you come and talk to this school? Because I'm going to be like, yeah, well, this is how much you want to pay me. Because if you, if you say the school doesn't have the budget, then that means the, 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 there could be a child in that day that could have really needed that talk for that day, for that moment. So I'm not going to allow money to stop that. Because if I do, then it's like now it's a, it's a job now. So, you know, I, I'm going to have to. And for me, I, I, I believe everyone should have something where there's no material gain involved. There's no material. It's just you doing of you and it fulfills you. Like for me as an actor, being an actor doesn't fulfill me. It makes me proud. You know, it makes me proud. You know, I don't, I don't believe this is just me. I don't believe you become fulfilled from being an actor because yes, you're entertaining people, but at the same time, it's all about you. That it's like, a, it's, it's an ego based thing. Like you, you, it's, it's about you. You are the entertainer. You are the person that you, 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 you. So for me, acting doesn't fulfill me. It makes me proud. You know, it, um, I express through performance and stuff, but guess what? If, if people think you're crap, that's going to hurt your ego. Cause then you ain't going to get no job. <laughs> so as much as we people can try to say, you know, I love it so much and this is what I ever want to do. It fulfills me. Well, no, because Judd acting is based on what people's opinions are about you. So you have to impress them. Like you act as an actor. I have to impress James because if James don't like me and people don't want to buy pay to see me, no one ain't going to hire me. So whereas when I do talks, it ain't about impressing. It's about giving a message and hopefully somebody takes from that message. So for me, that's my work where I don't, I don't, I wouldn't put a price on it. The, the, the way that I've, I've been living my life, you just, I just have to have balance, man. I have to have balance. So I'll, I, I'm not, I, I ain't going to be out here acting for free, but what, what, what I do for free? What, what, what is it that Ace would do for free that will take up his time that will, you know, make him miss time with his children, miss time with his family, with time in, in work. What would I do? And that's it for me. That's the one thing. So as long as I've got a one thing and I feel like everyone should have it a one thing and it's, it can't be family. You can't be family and friends. That's what you do anyway. It has to be non-related to you. Nothing, you know, you, that, you know, this is your give back because I, I, everyone's beliefs are different, but for me, you have to, I believe you have to have balance and you have to have something fulfilled you because when you realize, look at a lot of these people that when they're so f financially orientated and they achieve everything, when they believe they've achieved everything, a lot of them plummet down and they go to drugs or they break down because they believe they've achieved everything. So it's like, what else is there? If you believe you've achieved everything in life that you've wanted to achieve and you've achieved it, basically, there's no point in you living anymore. <laughs> you've, you've done everything you wanted to do. So, and that's why when you decide to do something for other people, that's ongoing for life because you can't help everybody in the world. You can't even help everybody in your country, let alone probably in your area. So it's like, that just gives you life because it's like, there's so much people out there to help. So it just sustains you. But once you reach that pinnacle point as a, as an actor, look at most of them, they become philanthropists and stuff. Because if you don't, where is there else there to go? Like, there's nowhere else. So there you have it, Ace Rowell. My thanks to Ace for joining me on the show and my thanks to you, the listener, 
for joining me once again this week. As always, thank you very much for listening. If you like the show, then please do uh, subscribe on whatever podcast platform you're on. Uh, share it with your friends, your family, your neighbors, the person that you see walking down the street. And uh, uh, if you want to help to contribute to the show, then you can go to patreon.com forward slash the last line to donate. Thank you very much for joining me. I've been James Alban, and this is The Last Line.